Welcome everyone to the first in our Clinical Innovations and Telehealth Learning Series. I'm Heather Gotham. I'm the Director of the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, that's MHTTC Network Coordinating Office. We have a great uh, panel today to talk about telehealth and suicide care. And I wanted to um, acknowledge all of our co-sponsors of this event, a number of the, the MHTTC centers in our network. Next slide. A few housekeeping items. We've made every attempt to make sure that today's presentation is secure. If something happens and we need to um, end the presentation unexpectedly, we'll follow up using your registration information and see if we can get back on. All attendees are muted and can't share video. If you have a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A. So the Q&A is the place to ask questions, but if you have a comment or a link for all attendees, attendees or want to share something, use the chat. Notice that you can chat just to the panelists or to um, all attendees, so mind who you're chatting to. But if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A. Within the next few days, you'll receive an email following the presentation um, on how to access a certificate of attendance. We're only providing certificates of attendance to folks who were on for at least 30 minutes, so please note that. Um, we are recording the session and the recording and the slide deck will be posted on our website within a few days. So we will get out all the information to everyone. You can also follow us on social media. Next slide. The MHTTC network is really here to accelerate the adoption and implementation of mental health evidence-based practices. We're a SAMHSA funded network of 10 regional centers a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and Network Coordinating Office. Here's our website address. Next slide. So the first thing I'd love for you to do when we get off today's meeting is to find your MHTTC, find your center. Um, here is a map of our network. Again, 10 regional centers and two national focus area centers. Um, and you can connect with your regional center and find out what services, what training and TA they're providing. Next. Just a disclaimer that the opinions expressed today are the views of the speakers and not, do not reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. Next. We'll be doing an evaluation at the end, so more information on that. We'll ask you to do a brief survey about today's training. Next. So I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today's talk. Barbara Stanley is a professor of medical psychology at the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She's also a director of the Suicide Prevention Training Implementation and Evaluation Program and a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Julie Goldstein Grummet is the director of the Zero Suicide Institute at EDC and director of health and behavioral health initiatives at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, the SPRC, a gracious co-host of today's talk. SPRC is the nation's federally funded resource center devoted to advancing the US national strategy for suicide prevention. Both the, suicide, both the Zero Suicide Institute and the SPRC are part of the Education Development Center. I'll turn things over now to Julie to get us started, thanks. Thanks, Heather. Next slide. So this is the Clinical Innovations in Telehealth, and we're going to be talking about telehealth and suicide care, and we really appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, SPRC is also funded by SAMHSA, so the views, opinions, and content don't necessarily reflect the opinions of SAMHSA or HHS. Next slide. Uh, the learning objectives for today's webinar to share resources to support you as you provide suicide care during this quarantine. Everything that we'll talk about is actually applicable outside of quarantine. These are evidence-based practices, but we do know that adapt adaptations have to be made during this time of quarantine, and Barbara will talk at length about how to develop a meaningful safety plan via telehealth, and then we'll take your questions. Next slide. As Heather said, I'm with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and the SPRC is really dedicated to advancing the national strategy for suicide prevention. There's a national strategy for asthma and obesity, and there's a national strategy for suicide prevention. It's gonna be updated, hopefully, uh, in the next year or two, as it was uh, released in 2012. So it'll be coming up on its 10-year anniversary soon. 
Goals eight and nine of the national strategy really emphasize clinical preparedness and for both clinicians and for healthcare systems to identify and care for people at risk for suicide. This concept was left out of the first national strategy in 2002 with the, under, with the belief that people were receiving this type of training in grad school or through continuing eds and that the healthcare system was sort of well positioned to care for people at risk for suicide. And you all are well positioned, but we also know that training and evidence-based practices and structure um, to advance your practice and ensure that uh, any door is the right door, any healthcare door is the right door, uh, is absolutely essential. And SPRC provides tools and resources and information for all different types of settings across the lifespan and across settings. So whether it's mental health providers or school systems, communities, faith, first responders, we have resources. Uh, we curate these to ensure that they are meeting the evidence and that they are useful and user friendly. Some we develop, some others develop, but I would recommend uh, if you haven't looked at sprc.org, take a look. Next slide. And if you do go to sprc.org, one of the things you might want to do is sign up for our weekly newsletter. I uh, include research and funding and best practices. The other thing that you may want to sign up for is the Zero Suicide Listserv. You can do that via uh, emailing zerosuicide at edc.org. We have 2,000, well over 2,000 members. People are extremely gracious and generous about sharing their best practices and their templates and their thoughts and their concerns about how to best care for people at risk for suicide in healthcare systems. We know we probably won't get to all of your questions today. There's a lot of people on the call and I've already seen a lot of great questions uh, that many of you filled out when you registered, but the conversation doesn't have to be limited to today. We really would encourage you to use that list or people are, um, many people across the country and, and even across the world are members of that listserv and really trying to think through some of the same processes and circumstances that you all are in. So please consider joining that listserv by emailing zerosuicide at edc.org. Next slide. And I just kind of wanted to set the stage a little bit for how the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and really the suicide prevention community thinks about suicide care. We know that suicide is multidimensional and we know that no single intervention is going to drive down the rates of suicide. We can't just kind of pick one particular practice, stick with it and expect that suicide is going to go down. I've been talking a little bit already about zero suicide, which is a bundle of evidence-based practices that healthcare systems should use to effectively um, provide suicide care. We know it reduces suicides by about 65 to 75 percent, but we also know even in the community suicide prevention requires a bundle of interventions that are sustained and that are based on your local data in terms of looking at who's at risk and what kind of strategic plans and goals you want to set for your own community. That drives what some of the interventions are. So today's presentation, Barbara's going to focus on screening and safety planning, and we're going to take your questions, and these are very critical pieces of care but I do want to lay the foundation that protecting people from suicide requires more than just that, a comprehensive approach to really how you're going to identify people, ensure that they're getting care that targets their symptoms, um, and then ensure that you're going to continue to provide care as they transition between different providers or between different uh, service settings in your community. Next slide. I'm just gonna walk through a couple of resources so that you know what's available through SPRC and after today's webinar. So this is the Zero Suicide website I mentioned, zerosuicide.com. And just to reiterate, really, Zero Suicide is this comprehensive framework that if you think about the airline industry or the nuclear industry that has vision zero as their target, zero is the only acceptable number and they do continuous quality improvement to ensure that they are, are moving towards find, zero suicides in their populations. No blame for when an adverse event occurs, but rather an opportunity to, to fix an error. And that's how we think about suicide care and healthcare systems. Uh, we wanna track if we're doing screening and safety plan, and we wanna make sure that we're doing that with every patient, every time who's at risk for suicide, um, and track on that to and provide training of those practices. And Barbara's gonna give a lot of big, uh, wonderful information about best practices in a moment. Next slide.
We've put together resources for your use during this time during coronavirus. Uh, the, the link is there. Included in that link is the webinar we held, the SPRC held about a month ago. Barbara was one of our speakers where we talked about telehealth and safety planning and treatment interventions that are applicable during quarantine. If, if you weren't able to join the, per, the webinar live, it's archived on that link below. And I really encourage you to listen to it. We've also curated other resources made um, that you might find helpful during this time. And we're continuing to add to that. Next slide. Our colleagues with the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention released this document recently about care transitions. And even though it's not, um, it wasn't designed for this current environment in which we're living in the pandemic, it does really help to provide a framing for how to do patient engagement and safety during the transition from inpatient to outpatient care. There are principles I think that you can apply here and, and you know, we're happy to take questions later about some of the ways to do this via telehealth. And clearly inpatient systems are still taking, in, in many cases, still seeing patients at risk for suicide. So if you're not familiar with this resource, definitely encourage you to take a look. Next slide. It's a diverse audience, so I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of the breadth of some of the resources that we have. We have a toolkit for high schools. And I think while this may not be entirely applicable right now, as people head back to school in the fall, we know there's an increased risk for mental health challenges and uh, increased risk for suicide potentially. I think, as I was already talking about, sort of this comprehensive approach, the toolkit really applies that around how do high schools manage and prepare for suicide risk. When a suicide does happen, you know, you want to have templates available and know what the proper steps are and how to support the entire school community, and that's the other toolkit, but after a suicide. And then we have a suite of resources on these sort of information sheets, whether it's for high school mental health providers or first responders or the faith community, uh, corrections. This is just one example. Next slide. And I wanted to share that on the SPRC pages, you can find your state suicide prevention coordinator. If you don't know them, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to them. They are a wealth of information, potentially resource sharing um, possibilities, and certainly important for them to know about the work you're doing and ways that they can um, supplement and accelerate that and vice versa. So each state is listed often with their state plan as well, where you can take a look. Um, as well as Garrett Lee Smith grantees, National Strategy grantees, and Zero Suicide grantees. So definitely encourage you to uh, take a look and make some linkages with other people doing great work in your, in your state and community. Next slide. And lastly, I just wanted to give you a um, set of crisis hotline numbers available in one place. Uh, you, I imagine you're familiar by now with the Disaster Distress Hotline and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, but there are a few other resources I wanted to make sure people were aware of during this time to share with families uh, and the people with whom you're working. And now I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, and then I'll look forward to taking your questions um, when Barbara's finished. And I want to thank Barbara uh, for joining me. We've done several of these webinars recently, and she's really just a wealth of information. So turning it over to you. Julie, it looks like we have Thanks. lost Barbara momentarily. Are you able to? Sure, let's go her? ahead. Next. Next slide. So Heather introduced Barbara. Let me just see if I've heard from her. Um, next slide. And if somebody, if from Heather, somebody from your team can resend Barbara the link. It seems like she got booted out of the room. So if somebody can send that to her. And we know during this time, the pandemic means that we have to be socially distanced and isolated and everybody's really had to kind of come on board very quickly with telehealth in order to provide health care. And that includes mental health services. And we do know that these are reliable activities that can happen via telehealth. Um, I saw some questions where people were asking when they registered, is it just as effective? And the answer is we do know that it works. And in fact, some people are reporting that they like it better. 
It's been expanding for years, um, but individuals who are suicidal are often excluded from telehealth services. I think that's um, out of fear of liability. And now we were kind of thrust into this moment where that um, can no longer be the case. And it's really meant all of you have to think very differently. So you've had to find ways to safely work with suicidal individuals. And Barbara um, will talk at length in a moment about safety planning and how to do that. Next slide. So she's, her presentation is gonna talk about the basic guidelines for how do you initiate remote contact? How do you do remote screening? How do you do clinical management of people at risk for suicide? Uh, and how do you really do a thorough safety plan? I do wanna stop because because I do know that somebody kind of talked about how do you contract for safety while people are in telehealth. And I wanna clarify that a safety plan is not the same thing as a contract for safety. Uh, once upon a time when I was in grad school, that's what we were taught to do. And that was a while ago. We know that contracting for safety can often make the individual uh, clinician potentially feel more comfortable, but it really doesn't do anything for the person at risk. The person at risk needs plans, how they're going to manage their anxiety and their distress, things that they can do to reduce that distress safely um, and effectively, and how they can continue to ideally manage themselves without having to be hospitalized. That's the purpose of a safety plan. A contract for safety is a document, but it doesn't actually bind them to anything and it doesn't teach them anything uh, with regard to being an intervention that they can build upon. So um, please don't use contracts for safety, only safety planning. And if somebody wants to let me know when Barbara's back on. I'm uh, back. Oh, well, then I'm happy to turn it over to you or keep going. Yeah. So where are you, Julie? I'm sorry, my computer yeah. just shut off, and so I'm back. Thank you. I just did the safety planning bullet and did my a 10-second PSA about don't do contracts for safety. So the last three bullets are on you. Okay. So thank you all for uh, joining today. Um, so one of the things that uh, that we've learned is really useful, uh, and it does put a burden on clinicians, but um, it avoids, it can avoid having to go to the ED and, um, and also um, having um, to, um, to have people have hospitalization. So we can do check-ins um, and, and they can be by phone uh, typically or video conference um, and they're really good and I'll talk a little bit about how to do them. Uh, in a few minutes. Documentation, like always, is important. And then um, finally, um, support for yourself as a clinician is important, not just during COVID, but in general, especially as we're doing telehealth and staying home more. Um, we kind of get into a routine of just working, working, working. Um, and so it's really important to take time out for yourself um, so that you are a better clinician. Next slide. Um, so under ordinary circumstances, and, um, and we know this a lot from working within New York State with a broad range of clinicians, um, working with suicidal individuals is very anxiety producing. And that's when you have the person in your office with them and sitting across from them and you can see their body language. When you have them on the telephone um, or even in a video conference, you, you can't get the same quite um, kind of feel that you can when they're sitting in front of you in the office. And, um, and so even when they're sitting in the office with you, it makes us anxious to know that if we let this person leave our office, they could go out and do something to hurt themselves. Um, and so um, doing telehealth with them um, presents unique challenges. One thing that's important to remember now is that individuals who have been um, suicidal before could likely experience, a, this is not rocket science, could likely experience a, a spike in suicide risk under the current circumstances. And it could be from, um, I, it could be from actually any number of things during this particular crisis that we're undergoing. It could be from isolation or it could be from, uh, you know, everybody is going out and everybody is happy and the suicidal person really doesn't have a lot of people in their lives. And so they experience a real sense of um, aloneness and loneliness. Um, or it could be from job loss and financial uh, uncertainty. Um, so I want to just present some pragmatic guidelines for managing um, 
uh, and evaluating suicide risk via telehealth. Um, next slide. And I just want to stress that this is something we definitely can do. Um, we, we don't typically, we, we think about like triaging those people out. But if you've been trained in dialectical behavior therapy, you know that you, um, you manage suicide risk all the time over the phone. So, but there's a few key things that are really important. First of all, when you start the conversation with somebody who may be at risk, in, actually for anybody uh, that you do a telehealth appointment with, it's good to know where are they. Um, in case you need to do something to rescue them, um, you, you never know what is going to happen. What happens if this is somebody who just has anxiety and for some reason faints and falls to the floor and you have no clue where they are? So you want to start out every session, whether the person is suicidal or not, with knowing where they are. Get their location. And then, if possible, also request an emergency contact information. And you do this in a kind of a way that is just matter of fact. And, um, and this is just uh, what I would say is this is my procedure. This is how I start out every session uh, with somebody. And then it doesn't become like in the middle of the session when they start declaring suicidality, you say, okay, so where are you? And they, they get afraid that you're gonna call the police. You just do it as a matter of routine. Uh, and then before you jump in and start the session, you develop a plan with them should the video call or session be interrupted. And then as much as possible, you try to have the person secure their privacy. Um, and then uh, also with the person, you would want to talk with them about, um, you would want to have in your mind um, how, what kind of plan you have for uh, staying on the phone in that rare circumstance where you need to arrange emergency rescue. For minors, uh, plan in advance when and how to bring parents or guardians into the conversation. This is important for if you are going to be doing safety planning. We always include somebody, a, you know, a, a guardian or parent into the conversation about safety planning and share it with them. Next slide. Okay, these are two simple screening tools that, that, uh, that are commonly used. The Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, the screening tool, asks very direct questions about, um, about suicidality and um, the same thing with the ask. It, again, also direct questions. And so this is really important. So you, you may kind of walk up to the idea of asking about suicide um, slowly, but you do want to get to the point where you ask the questions directly. Um, and it's really important. Um, I've had patients say to me, well, my other therapist never asked me about this, and so I figured they didn't want to know. Um, and so you want to know, and it's really important. Next slide. So um, in addition to whatever you do for your standard risk assessment, uh, SAMHSA has um, a, a, a nice tool called a safety. Um, but uh, in addition, what you want to do is assess for the emotional impact of the current crisis on suicide risk. So there's a whole lot of, of, um, of risk factors that we wanna ask about that you might not ask about um, normally. Um, some of these are definite what you, uh, what you would ask about, but like COVID specific might be dis disruptive disruptions in your routine, decreased um, social support, financial concerns, and so on. The other thing that's really important for people who are um, sheltering in place is to ask about increased access to lethal means. A lot of people went out and bought lots of over-the-counter medications, stockpiled their prescription medications, and these are lying around the house. Um, and so if you have somebody who is suicidal living in the house, this is um, a very dangerous situation. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Next. Um, okay, so um, things are loosening up a little bit in terms of hospitals and EDs. We don't really know what the future holds, but um, if we can avoid having somebody go to the ED, it's a really good idea, whether we're in a crisis or not. Um, you know, the one thing that's important to remember is that, that suicidal crises are relatively short-lived, um, and so 
sometimes you'll see somebody who will end up going to the ED, and by the time they are finished with their evaluation, the suicidal crisis has ended, but there they are, and they're going to probably get hospitalized. Um, so, but you just can't, uh, you just can't say to the person, well, okay, so we want to avoid going to the, having you go to the ED, um, let, just stay at home. You want to offer them something instead, and so we're going to do a safety plan with them. I'm not going to talk about all about what a safety plan is. I'm going to just talk about the adaptations to it um, during the current time. But there's another very simple thing, which is just to increase the clinical contact that you have with the person until the risk de-escalates. And, um, and this is a very, very powerful tool that we often don't use. A brief 10, 15 minute check-in a couple times can get somebody through a suicidal crisis. Uh, it's a heck of a lot less taxing on the individual than going to the, to the ED and then getting hospitalized. We always provide crisis hotline and text uh, information. And then we identify with them who are the individuals in their current environment to help monitor their suicidal thoughts. And we get permission to talk with them um, if, um, if the person uh, thinks that it would be helpful. And, um, and then let them know what are ways that they can help the suicidal person through a crisis. Um, and one thing that's important to know is that there, if somebody has been suicidal over long periods of time, they usually have their kind of go-to people who they turn to. Um, but uh, now, you know, everybody is experiencing the same thing. We're all in a crisis, right? And so the person who they might normally turn to in, um, in their own crisis when everything else is fine may be a total wreck during this period of time, understandably. And so they have to reevaluate who it is that they're going to turn to. Um, there may not be anybody else, but you at least want them to take a look at that. We, of course, have a safety plan with them. And then you also can just collaborate with them to identify other alternatives to, to manage their risk. And so the key to all of this is collaboration. Okay, next slide, please. So even though we're trying to avoid hospitalization, it's really important to remember that if the person needs to be hospitalized or needs an evaluation in the ED, they should go to the hospital. Um, they should not be afraid that they are going to get COVID from going to the hospital. Hospitals now are very um, well protected. Um, it's, um, if you look at the figures from New York State, for example, the rate of, um, of COVID positivity was uh, several points lower in healthcare workers than it was in the general public in New York State. Um, so this is a, a, a safe environment um, if the person really needs to go to the hospital. Um, and so you as the clinician should try to figure out a way. This is not easy, especially if we're working at home. Um, if risk is imminent, to stay on the phone if possible until the person is in the care of a professional, or at least there is a supportive person in their environment who will accompany them to the hospital. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is this is not easy because um, uh, you know we we have one phone or you know one computer. So if you are working with somebody who is suicidal, it might be better to think about um, about having um, a video conference with them using your computer, and so that you have your cell phone free uh, in case you need to call a third party. Um, okay, so this is I mentioned this just um, a bit before, um, suicidal crises are actually relatively short. They do not stay constant. Um, and this is really important um, because the, the period of time where somebody who is suicidal and they may walk around the world feeling suicidal all the time, but that period of time when they are actually in danger of acting on their suicide thoughts is relatively short. And so what we wanna try to do is get them through that relatively short period of time. And, and then, of course, we work uh, with them on the kinds of things that have elevated their baseline, their risk over time, their depression, the PTSD, what are their life stressors, those things. So we don't forget about all those, but it's just important to remember 
that we want to kind of um, keep in mind that this period of danger is relatively brief. And that by that period, I mean the, the place where they go from thinking about suicide to actually acting on it. For some people, it's just minutes. And that's why a safety plan comes in handy. That's why actually these brief check-ins come in handy. Um, next slide. Okay, so safety plan. This is just like when you get on a plane, which not too many of us are doing these days. Um, it, everybody knows that every single time we get on a flight, we go through what are the safety measures that, um, that are important on a, on a plane. And um, if I were to say to you, should the, the uh, oxygen level in the cabin drop and you're traveling with a young child, who do you put the oxygen mask on first? I bet every single one of you knows uh, that you put it on yourself first and then you put it on the, um, uh, the child. And so that is the whole idea behind a safety plan. Um, you you people to th have to think when they are in an emergency, which of course cabin pressure dropping in a plane is an emergency. The same thing is true when somebody is in a suicidal crisis. How clearly are we thinking if we are in the kind of state of mind um, that where we can, where we are thinking of killing themselves. We are, we're not good at generating solutions to what we can do instead or, or how we should proceed. Um, next slide. And so that's where safety planning comes in. This is just um, a simple brief intervention that we do with our um, uh, suicidal clients. We first help them identify what their warning signs are. This is not easy for some people because they can't figure out what got them to this place. Um, and the, the easiest way of doing this is to have them uh, tell the narrative, just tell their story about how they got to be in the suicidal crisis. And so um, they're not going to know what their warning signs are, but you're going to know as the clinician what their warning signs are. Um, as they're telling the story. They might, be, might, they might, for example, have a thought, things are never gonna get better. I'm always gonna be stuck like this. That's a warning sign. Okay, so we have the warning signs. Why do, we, why do we want the warning signs? We want the warning signs so that they know these are your clues that you are in a danger zone. You gotta grab that safety plan and start putting it into action. And then there are just a few other steps. Um, uh, to developing a plan with people, we tell them, okay, so remember, we have done some psychoed with them. We told them that the suicidal crisis is relatively short lived. We want to get them through that period of time when they are at risk of, um, of acting on their suicidal thoughts. This does not necessarily make suicidal thoughts go away. As Julie mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of other things that we need to do to help suicidal people. This is simply to get them through that crisis so that then you have your client there again to work on what are the things that got them into this place. Um, and so there's simple things, internal coping strategies, very, very simple kinds of strategies that, um, that we uh, have people use that are just things that they can do by themselves to take their mind off, off their problems. Again, this is just simple distracting things. It's like we want time to pass to allow two things to happen, emotions to re-regulate and for um, the suicidal crisis to dissipate. Because again, we don't stay in that suicidal thought forever. We use social supports in the same way that we use coping strategies for distraction. Um, we also use social support for help. So we have two different ways that we're using social support. The first is not telling people um, that you're suicidal, but just engaging them uh, in, a, uh, in a conversation or going to a social setting. Um, social supports then who you can turn to for help. Uh, this is very different. The people who you turn to for distraction may not be the people that you turn to, to who you would say, I'm in trouble. Then we also have on the safety plan who they turn to for professional help. And then finally, at the end, this is not what they do with their safety plan They, when they are in a suicidal crisis. Hopefully, they've already done this before. But when we're doing the safety plan uh, with them, we talk about means reduction. And so we're simply starting with within self-strategies all the way to, um, to 
uh, seeking outside help. And so this you could see kind of can build a sense of self-efficacy instead of having just on our uh, machines, if you are feeling suicidal on, on our recordings, um, if you're feeling suicidal, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. No, pull out your safety plan, see if it can help get you through it. Of course, if the person is so imminently suicidal, of course they go to the nearest emergency room. But a lot of times we can help them get through these crises without having to resort to that. Next. Okay, so remote safety planning is very similar um, to the way that we do in-person safety planning. Uh, we go through the same thing. Again, very importantly, it's a collaborative process. We do it together. Um, it's two people working together to figure out what are the best strategies. One of the, the things that we have to do is to arrange a way for the person to get a copy of the, the plan. Um, it, it's, um, uh, there are all different ways. Sometimes you can, if, if somebody is very, very low tech and you're, it's on the phone, um, you will have them grab a piece of paper and write down the responses as you're writing them down too. And when somebody is doing that, if, if that's the mode that you have chosen, I always tell them, okay, at the end of this, I'm just going to ask you to read back what you've, uh, what you've written. And that gives, this is especially useful when you're working with adolescents, so that they know that they actually should not just be listening to you and thinking, yeah, 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 but they should be writing down um, because you're going to be asking them to read it back. Um, more commonly, what we do is we either take a picture with our cell phone and send it, scan it, or email it, um, you know, and um, text the plan. Um, so, um, so there are a number of ways to get this done. Um, next slide. Um, Okay, so I, I talked a little bit about identifying warning signs. But there are new warning signs during this period of time that we have found. Um, extreme fear of illness, like illness escalating, coping with the illness of, uh, in, their, in themselves or with others, escalating uh, social isolation and loneliness, intensified family con conflict, and increased financial concern. So those are some of the big ones. Um, next. Um, so what are the kinds of simple things? These are, um, these are the coping skills that people can um, use by themselves. I, you know, coping skills is almost too big a word. They're kind of like coping activities that people can do by themselves. Um, and so uh, we have to remember that a lot of people are still socially isolating and, and, and being careful about going out. So we want to think about things that are um, that are safe to use. So it can be like mindfulness apps, um, do an activity that changes physical state. Often your, your, you know, your physical state will change your emotional state. Distracting activities are important. So it can be video games, watching certain kinds of TV programs and so forth. Self-soothing activities. Um, and um, if you know DBT, you know that this is an important part of, uh, of um, the stress tolerance. And then also contributing virtually. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so in addition to having people who can distract us, for some people they don't have um, a lot of people in their lives. Um, and so we don't want to leave a blank space on the safety plan. And so what we say is, okay, so who are the people uh, or the social places you can go to to distract yourself? So, um, uh, so often that would be when things were different, going to the local coffee shop, going to the library, going to the gym. Um, now that is kind of uh, still limited. Um, and we can think about what are the kind of the virtual activities that people can do. Virtual meetup programs where an activity is taking place, virtual hangouts, and interactive online games and forums. And then also, you know, don't forget about the current social environment, who they are living with, who can help um, as a distractor within that environment. Um, and then help them try to identify public places where it's safe for them to go. 
Next slide. Um, okay, I think I spoke enough about this. Um, what this is who they would um, um, would go to um, either um, in person or remotely if they say, I really need help with this. I need to tell somebody that I am in trouble. Um, it, it's useful if the client gives you permission to reach out to that person and uh, share the safety plan with them. One of the key things to know is that, you know, if you ask the person, will you share the safety plan with that individual or will you at least let that person know they're on your safety plan? If they say no, then you need to help them think about somebody else or problem solve why they won't, won't um, let that person know that they're on the safety plan. Um, and then, of course, you know, virtual contact may feel different or mean different things for different people. For some people, it's perfectly comfortable. It's more comfortable than in-person contact. Um, and, um, and then be specific when, um, when listing what kinds of um, adaptive options they're using. Is it a phone call? Is it texting? What are we doing? Um, how are you going to contact these people? And we try to get at least two people, preferably three people, that they could turn to. Next. And then, of course, you want to identify um, the, um, the emergency contacts. That, that would be the professionals and hotline. And then you want to be really specific with the emergency room. Some emergency rooms have changed their procedures now. If, if this is somebody who you work with in an ongoing way, it would be wonderful for your client if you could get for them in advance, know, for yourself to know in advance what are the procedures that people are, uh, what that the emergency room is following now um, before somebody comes into the hospital. Next. Okay, so this again, as I said, is really important. Um, because of possible changes in the learning, in the living environment, people are st stuck inside with a group of people if they're doing it right. And again, we may have um, a lot of over-the-counter and prescription medications at hand. Also, there have been a big rise in purchase of firearms. Um, and so, number one, we want to talk with them about making sure that firearms are either removed or safely stored. Usually, people are not going to be that crazy about removing them, um, but uh, but a discussion about safely storing them and letting them know that this is not like you're not going to have your firearm removed forever. It's just for a period of time to help get you through this time so that then we can lower your suicide risk. And then there are lots of ways, I won't go into them now, about how to reduce access to over-the-counter medication, having somebody else hold them, having them locked away. Um, you know, just to limit access so that the person, when they are in that suicidal state, doesn't have ready access to means. All the time, you as the clinician are thinking, uh, okay, this is only going to be brief. How am I going to help them get through this brief period of time? You know, that adage of like, if somebody wants to kill themselves, they will. What's the point of doing any of this kind of lethal means restriction? It's absolutely not true. Um, if somebody wants to kill themselves, that that period of time is relatively brief. And if we get them through that period of time, they won't want to kill themselves. Next slide. Okay, just a few more things and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so one of the things that um, is an additional um, adaptation that you can do with safety planning is to um, think about um, what are the kinds of reserves that you can help that that help uh, a person during this period of time? That can like, uh, if you think about a car running on empty versus a full tank of gas, you want to ha to have the suicidal client think about what are the kinds of things that can help you keep a full tank of gas. Um, and uh, and the reason is very simple. When we are um, when we have a lot of reserves, when we have, it, it's, it's not as, uh, we're not as going to be in much danger in entering a suicidal crisis as when our reserves are depleted. And so, okay, so we have the safety plan over here, should you get into that danger zone? 
what can we do to help you keep out of getting into that danger zone to begin with? Um, and so they're actually really simple things that people can do to build reserves. Um, help develop, um, help them develop a daily plan and follow it. In other words, like seriously, a daily plan. Monday, I'm doing this, this, this at this time, Tuesday, and so forth. Um, in addition to that, uh, this is overall keep a regular schedule. Pay attention to sleeping, eating, exercising. Go outdoors at least once uh, daily in a safe manner if somebody is still uh, socially isolating. This is actually. Uh, important and patients have talked about this as like kind of like a way of staying connected and still feeling like in the world. Um, and it, encourage acceptance of the range of feelings. This is really um, a, um, a very important thing. Uh, people can get down on themselves for feeling frightened, for feeling scared about all of the uncertainty. And this is really a time where everybody needs a dose of acceptance for we only we are going to have a lot of feelings frustration anger um, anxiety um, so many different feelings people may feel depressed and it's um it's important to start from the place of accepting that this we're in this terrible crisis um how can we um how can we get through it in order to get to that place of how can I get through it? You have to accept first where you are. And then finally, this is an opportunity to build mastery, take on a new activity safely within the confines of your home and, um, and encourage doing pleasurable activities. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna just um, end by talking a little bit about check-ins and ongoing contact. So check-ins, Definitely, I can tell you this 100% can avoid ED visits and hospitalizations. And so I have done this in any number of ways. Um, to the biggest extreme, either the furthest extreme, I've had rare, rare, rare instances where I've checked in with the person several times a day uh, for a couple days. Um, more than likely, it might be a brief daily check-in or um, if they are in a suicidal crisis, or if somebody knows they're gonna be talking to you just for a brief check-in in two days, they can say, okay, I can hang on till then. So how long do you think you can use the safety plan and stay safe? Two days, okay, great, we'll check in then. And then you do another evaluation. So um, this does um, put a burden on clinicians to kind of, if you're working with a lot of suicidal people, um, to add that into your schedule, but it it really, I, honestly, I believe it saves lives and it certainly avoids uh, ED visits and hospitalization. So the check-in is short and if it's going a very long time, um, you're not doing something right. So it's clear from the outset that you'll say, okay, this is going to be a brief check-in not a session, and so you want to set the parameters so the person knows that they're not going to be, you know, on a video conference call with you for 45 minutes. It's going to be a brief check-in, um, and, um, and so that's what I say, like, okay, we'll do a check-in. We'll see how you're doing. Make a plan to help you stay safe, um, and, uh, and then move on, and so that's kind of what we do um, with the brief check-in. So we start with lit literally checking in about their suicidality, um, review any particular changes in risk or protective factors, particularly risk factors. Next slide. Um, we review the safety plan uh, and update it as, as needed. And, um, and so you start out with simple, hi, how are you doing? This is our brief check-in. Just want to see what your mood has been like, what your suicidality is like. I'm just, can I just ask you, um, a few questions about that. Um, has, have, has anything changed since we last talked? Um, and um, okay, so now I wanna move to, it sounds like things are going okay, but you're still feeling bad. Um, now let's talk about your safety plan. Um, have, you, have you had the need to use it? How has it worked? What has, uh, what has worked, what hasn't? Do we need to change anything on the, the safety plan? Um, and then you simply plan for the next contact. And so 
um, you base the contact, the, the next contact on the acuity of the risk. If somebody is still um, in a very vulnerable state, you would plan that sooner than later. If somebody says, you know what, thank you, I got through that period of time, you say, okay, so can we just meet our next, um, at our next scheduled time next week? And you talk with them. And then I always let them know, look, if something changes, if things go south, please let me know. Um, and we can schedule a brief check-in and I you know that's kind of like in caps so that people know and they don't get hurt and offended when you're ending it really quickly next slide um, okay so we want to make sure this is you know of course what you would do you document all your interactions and your thinking you still would try to figure out a way to consult with your supervisors and peers. I'm sure you all have um, virtual uh, supervision and peer support now. And, um, and you want to attend to your own sense of isolation and your own mental health. Next. Um, and then also just remember that if you have several suicidal clients who you're working with, you should you know, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise that you're feeling burdened. And, um, and so you, should, you need to just acknowledge that for yourself and maybe turn to your peers or your supervisor for support in getting through that period of time and increase your self-care activities if possible. The other thing that's important is to arrange for periods of coverage if possible. So you need a time out, you need a time away. And so what I do is when I have suicidal clients who I'm working with, I will just say, look, I'm not, I'm not gonna be around for, I'm not gonna be available for the next 24 hours. Let's talk about what you'll do instead in case you need me and just make plans. This is totally okay. Um, and not only is it okay, it's the right thing to do. Next yeah. slide. Okay, so I just want to end here. These are some of the resources available, um, and uh, I hope that you got something out of this presentation. Well, thank you so much, Barbara and Julie. This is Thomasine Heitkamp from the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. This was incredibly helpful, and I'm seeing all kinds of interesting comments in the chat box, important comments about how this is standard of care. One of the things that, that uh, questions that are being raised is do the safety plans look different when you're doing them using telehealth rather than in person? And I think either one of you could answer that. So I, I don't see um, see how they should be different. It's a, it's a little bit clunkier because you're not looking at the same piece of paper, the same document together. Um, but I, you know, I think that it, you know, in a way, it might take a little longer because you want to do more check-ins and just make sure that you are um, you, you literally on the same page. The other, the other thing that I think, in a way, there is a benefit for with um, doing it remotely because I do think that it calls on the clinician to pay much more attention to collaboration and engagement of the person on the other end of the conference call or the, uh, the Zoom call, whatever way you're doing it. That, that certainly makes sense. Uh, and there's another a series of questions that might be premature as we look at COVID-19, but do we have any current data on any increase or decrease in rates of suicide post physical distancing from COVID-19? Uh, so Julie, I don't know if you know anything about the, the only, I think that it is too soon to tell, but I, I can tell you that like if we go, I think, you know, we've never experienced anything like this. We don't have statistics yet, as far as I know. Maybe, Julie, you do. They're, in New York City, they're trying to gather these statistics quickly. Um, but, um, you know, in the immediate time of a crisis, you know, like after 9-11, the suicide didn't go up, it went down. It's like, it's the, then the, as the tail, as, it, as we move away from the crisis, then the psychiatric problems crop up and then suicidality goes up. So I don't know, Julie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, somebody asked that actually in the Q&A and I, I hope you can see my answers. I've been trying to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, exactly what Barbara said, it's hard to track 
um, sometimes suicide can take us months and even up to like a year and a half to get current data. And often people are really focused on their sort of immediate needs during crises, 9-11, Hurricane Katrina. I think we're thinking that, you know, the crisis is still yet to come, but I, I think the important takeaway is it doesn't have to be. And all of the things that Barbara's talking about and sort of the comprehensive approaches I was talking about, embed them now. <laughs> embed asking all of your clients, preparing your clients, preparing your at-risk clients that these are things that might happen to them. It's not alarmist, it's, it's good preparation, just as Barbara used the analogy about practicing the airbag on a plane. I think the more you think about using that routinely with all of your clients, um, hopefully then we can begin to reduce that curve and make it far more just common day conversation that's expected. Yeah, I, I also I think that uh, one of the major differences of uh, well there are many differences between 9-11 and now but the the financial consequences of um of covid it, are vast and we know that there is um uh in times of unemployment that suicide does go up so i think we have a lot of like warning signs like that we should be thinking about this and thinking about like what are the precursors to becoming suicidal and seeing if we can't do some of the prevention activities in advance of that so somebody's having an acute stress reaction how can we help them de deal with that um and uh, before it becomes ptsd thank you thank you barbara um, with the last couple of minutes that we have, I want to let everyone know we can't get all to, to all your questions in the Q&A box or some of the questions in the chat box. We will be preparing a document, a question and answer document following this session that will get at some of the questions. We'll provide you with some resources that talks about the capacity of telehealth and reminds you that telephones work and, and, and that's an important piece that we don't always have to think high tech and looking at some of those questions that are being asked that, that we can answer pretty seamlessly. I think uh, we've put lots of information up. The slides will be available. A recording of this presentation will be available and a question and answer document that we're gonna prepare following this because we had all, about 2000 people online so we couldn't get to all your questions. And most of all, I want to thank Heather Gotham for sponsoring this out of our National Coordinating Office and Barbara and Julie for joining us and providing this just critical information that providers are looking for. So your expertise is absolutely invaluable and we appreciate your time as a mental health technology transfer center uh, today in sharing with us. And to remind you, this is the first of, of uh, four other series, three other series. So we're going to be continuing to do this on May 26th. We've had a lot of requests on cognitive behavioral therapy and how to do that in telehealth. So join us again for that session and then some cultural relevance telehealth and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we pick topics for you that are clinical in focus that allow you to talk about telehealth in the context of clinical. So like Barbara just shared, Doing a safety plan might work better at a distance. So uh, thinking about what's working using telehealth and how we can do that best. And I see a lot of you are signing off as we're up against the hour, but again, appreciate everyone's time today, participating. It was fun to hear where you were all from. We had some international guests, so to them, a, a special shout out for joining us. I don't know what time zone you were on, but Thanks so much, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you on May 26th at the same time on Cognitive Behavioral. And we're going to be giving you a brief survey. This is what we're all funded by SAMHSA and the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. So if you can complete the survey, just giving us some feedback, we can always look at ways to improve and, and ways to give our, each other a high five. So appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to seeing you in on May 26th. Take care, everyone. Thank you. You bet.